I want to tell you about a plan you can follow, which takes only a little time each day, five days a week, and which brings results out of all proportion to the time spent. For a moment, consider the things your mind has brought you. Everything you have, your work, your relationship with your family and others, your philosophy of life, all come to you as a result of using your mind. Now consider the estimate made by experts. You have probably been operating on less than 10% of your mental capacities, much less. Dr. Herbert Otto, psychologist, educator, and chairman of the National Center for the Exploration of Human Potential, reminds us that many well-known scientists, such as the late Abraham Maslow, Margaret Mead, Gardner Murphy, O. Spurgeon English, and Carl Rogers, subscribe to the hypothesis that man is using a very small fraction of his capacities. Margaret Mead quotes a 6% figure. Herbert Otto writes, my own estimate is 5% or less. Neurological research at the UCLA Brain Research Institute points to enormous abilities latent in everyone by suggesting an incredible hypothesis. The ultimate creative capacity of the human brain may be, for all practical purposes, they pointed out, infinite. To use the computer analogy, man is a vast storehouse of data. But we have not learned how to program ourselves to utilize these data for problem-solving purposes. Yefremov, the eminent Soviet scholar and writer, says, man under average conditions of work and life uses only a small part of his thinking equipment. If he were able to force our brain to work at only half its capacity, we could, without any difficulty whatever, learn 40 languages, memorize the large Soviet encyclopedia from cover to cover, and complete the required courses of dozens of colleges. Now, this statement is hardly an exaggeration. It is the generally accepted theoretical view of man's mental potentialities. Now, how can we tap this gigantic potential? Well, it's a big and very complex problem with many ramifications. But as Herbert Otto points out, it is clear that persons who live close to their capacity, who continue to activate their potential, have a pronounced sense of well-being and considerable energy. They see themselves as leading purposeful and creative lives. If everything you have is the result of using just 10% of your mind, consider for a moment what it will mean to you and your family if you can increase this percentage. Now, none of us, as a rule, has the slightest notion of the real capabilities of his mind. But believe me when I say that your mind can be compared to an undiscovered gold mine. And it makes no difference whether you're 17 or 70. Look at it this way. Your goal is in the future. Your problem is to bridge the gap which exists between where you are now and the goal you intend to reach. This is the problem to solve. Robert Seashore, when chairman of the Department of Psychology at Northwestern University, pointed out that successful people are not people without problems. They're simply people who've learned to solve their problems. And there you have it. Living successfully, getting the things we want from life, is a matter of solving the problems which stand between where we now are and the point we wish to reach. No one is without problems. They're a part of living. But let me show you how much time we waste in worrying about the wrong problems. Here's a reliable estimate of the things people worry about. Things that never happen, 40%. Things over and past that can't be changed by all the worry in the world, 30%. Needless worries about our health, 12%. Petty miscellaneous worries, 10%. Real, legitimate worries, 8%. In short, 92% of the average person's worries take up valuable time, cause painful stress, even mental anguish, and are absolutely unnecessary. And of the real, legitimate worries, there are two kinds. There are the problems we can solve, and there are the problems beyond our ability to personally solve. But most of our real problems usually fall into the first group, the ones we can solve if we learn how. Now I'm going to assume you've decided upon a goal. Your problem is, how do I achieve it? Your goal may be a promotion, a greater income, a beautiful home. It makes little difference what your goal happens to be. But you have your goal, and you know that you will become and you will achieve what you think about. That is, if you stay with it, you will reach your goal. But how? Well, it's right here that your mind comes into play. What is your mind? No one knows for sure. Perhaps the best way to describe it is to quote Pulitzer Prize-winning playwright Archibald MacLeish. In his play, The Secret of Freedom, a character says, the only thing about a man that is a man is his mind. Everything else you can find in a pig or a horse. That's uncomfortably true. 
The human mind is the one thing that separates us from the rest of the creatures on Earth. Anything that comes to us in the future will almost certainly come to us as a result of the extent to which we use our minds. And yet it's the last place on Earth the average person will turn to for help. In order to reflect just a moment on the human mind, consider what it's accomplished. Human knowledge has advanced more in the past 50 years than in all the preceding 10,000 years of human civilization. Of all the scientists who ever lived, it's estimated that 90% of them are alive today. We have reached in the area of ideas and human advancement a plateau so high it was undreamed of by even the most optimistic forecasters as recently as 10 years ago. But every new idea triggers additional ideas so that now we're in an era of compounding advancement on every front and in every area that staggers the imagination. Dr. Harlow Shapley of Harvard has said that we're entering an entirely new age of man. He calls it the psychozoic age, the age of the mind. And you own one, free and clear. Now let's look at a few facts. Now the average working person has at his disposal an enormous amount of free time. In fact, if you total the hours in a year and subtract the sleeping hours, if he sleeps eight hours every night, you'll find he has almost 6,000 waking hours of which he spends less than 2,000 on the job. Now this leaves him 4,000 hours a year when he's neither working nor sleeping. These can be called discretionary hours with which we can do pretty much as we please. At least our minds are free. Now, so you can see the amazing results in your life, I want to recommend that you take just one hour a day, five days a week, and devote this hour to exercising your mind. Pick one hour a day on which you can fairly regularly count. And during this hour every day, take a completely blank sheet of paper. At the top of the page, write your present primary goal, clearly, simply. Then, since our future depends upon the way in which we handle our work, Write down as many ideas as you can for improving that which you now do. Try to think of 20 possible ways in which the activity that fills your day can be improved. You won't always get 20, but even one idea is good. Now remember two important points with regard to this. One, this is not particularly easy, and two, most of your ideas won't be any good. Now when I say it's not easy, I mean it's like starting any new habit. At first you'll find your mind a little reluctant to be hauled up and out of the old familiar rut, but as you think about your work and ways in which it might be improved, write down every idea that pops into your mind, no matter how absurd it might seem. Let me tell you what will happen. Some of your ideas will be good and worth testing. The most important thing this extra hour accomplishes, however, is that it deeply embeds your goal into your subconscious mind, starts the whole vital machinery working. And 20 ideas a day, if you can come up with that many, total 100 a week, even if you don't think on weekends. An hour a day, five days a week, totals 260 hours a year and still leaves you 3,740 hours of free leisure time. Now this means you'll be thinking about your goal and ways of improving your performance, increasing your service, six and a half full extra working weeks a year. Six and a half 40 hour weeks devoted to thinking and planning. Can you see how easy it is to rise above the so-called competition? and will still leave you with 15 hours a day to spend as you please. Starting each day thinking, you'll find that your mind will continue to work all day long. You'll find that at odd moments, when you least expect it, really great ideas will begin to pop into your mind, and when they do, write them down as soon as you can. Just one great idea can completely revolutionize your work, and as a result, your life. If you want to develop the muscles of your body, you take daily exercise of some sort. Well, the mind is developed in the same way, except that the returns out of all conceivable proportion to the time and energy spent. I've used this system for years, and it's given me some of the most gratifying and rewarding experiences of my life. And it costs only five hours a week. Five hours out of 168. Is it worth it? It's like spending five hours a week digging in a solid vein of pure gold, because your mind is all of that, and much more. Each time you write your goal at the top of the sheet of paper, don't worry or become concerned about it. Think of it as only waiting to be reached, a problem only waiting to be solved. Face it with faith and bend all the great powers of your mind toward solving it. And believe me, solve it, you will. Now let's briefly recap. This week, start spending one hour each day getting as many ideas as you can. Try for 20 a day on ways to improve what you're now doing. Remember, the achievement of your goal very likely depends upon it, as does your whole future. Two, 
If everything you now have is the result of using, say, 5 to 10 percent of your mental abilities, you can imagine what life will be like if you can increase this figure to 20 percent or more. Three, successful people are not people without problems. They're simply people who've learned to solve their problems. Four, don't waste time and energy worrying about needless things. 40% of them will never happen, 30% have already happened and can't be changed, 12% are needless worries about our health, 10% are petty miscellaneous worries, and only 8% are real. Try to separate the real from the unnecessary and solve those which are within your ability to solve. Last of all, the only thing in the world that can take you to your goals in life is your mind, its effective use, and following through on the good ideas it supplies you. Each of us has a tendency to underestimate his or her own abilities. We should realize that we have, deep within ourselves, a reservoir of great ability, even genius, that can be tapped if we'll just dig deep enough. It's the miracle of your mind.